this is Mike Emery with uh, uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. Uh, we are live streaming this on YouTube, so you may be seeing it there. Uh, and uh, this is also being recorded uh, within our own Zoom session. Uh, if you are on Zoom, you will notice the Q&A that we have for questions and the virtual raise hand. Otherwise, thank you everyone for coming and I'll turn it over to our uh, instructor, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, uh, this class is entitled 10 Women Writers. Uh, we're going through a quick gallop uh, this week and next week, five each session uh, of women writers that um, we think uh, may need a little more attention, may not be so well read, so well known, maybe some that are well known to you and just uh, a reason again why you might like to pick up some of their works. Um, we'll also be dealing with uh, in this these two sessions some, um, you, for those of you who know me, I tend to stick to British writers, but we're widening the, the, the pool a little here with writers from different countries and um, a lot more modern stuff than I normally teach. So again, I think a lot of you know me, Kay Menchel, I've been teaching at Ali for about 10 years now. He's my son, Cameron, and he's helping me out. Um, I didn't put him on the original um, uh, class proposal because uh, we thought that, you know, had the world been otherwise, he would have been in New York um, doing his summer internship in person instead of virtually, and here he is stuck in lockdown with his poor mother. So um, for those of you who don't know him, uh, he has a BA from William & Mary with honors in English. He is currently in the MFA program at Columbia, that's a Master of Fine Arts. Uh, he's writing short stories, he's working on his novel, and he has a summer internship, a readership at Guernica Magazine. And as I said, for him, unfortunately, um, that's online for me, very fortunately, I have my bartender at home. Um, <clears throat> Cameron has taught classes before at Ali, um, American Short Stories and Philip Roth were two of his long session classes. So um, I hope you'll enjoy his contributions too. He's the one who constantly pushes me to read new people and American authors and women writers. And um, I'm the one who tends to drag him to the past and sort of, you know, going, Jane Austen, Jane Austen. Um, so th there's uh, always this tension going on between what we read and what we talk to each other about. But I hope that you will find this um, helpful and useful. So um, you can go sit, make yourself comfortable for a few minutes. Um, how we're going to work this is I'm going to talk a little bit about these authors. And then um, I'm gonna pause before time's up uh, on my sort of section and see if anybody has any questions, any comments. Um, we are, it is a quick gallop through these. We can't do them in any depth, but the intention really is to, to give you some inspiration for um, further reading or some, you know, highlight some things you may have forgotten about or may want to revisit um, between the next session next week, we've got a couple of months between um, early semesters, so plenty of reading time. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about is Elizabeth Gaskell. Uh, she was born in 1810 and lived until 1865. And the reason I picked Elizabeth Gaskell is that she's very often overshadowed by all the other Victorians, particularly the Brontes and um, uh, uh, George Eliot in terms of women writers. Uh, but also, of course, you know, that we've been working our way, as a lot of you know, through the, the Dickens canon in my other classes. And uh, Elizabeth Gaskell, uh, a Victorian writer who gets somewhat um, short shrift, I think, in some ways. Um, she's had a revival in popularity recently because um, some of her works, a lot of her works have been adapted for television. Uh, Cranford, North and South um, have, have been uh, made into popular BBC serials. So you may have seen some of those. Um, I'm gonna quote a little bit about her life from the beginning. There's a lovely book by John Sutherland called Lives of the Novelists, which if you don't want to read it, you can also use it to prop your doors open. Um, 
But he talks about Elizabeth Gaskell, who we are used to seeing as Mrs. Gaskell. And um, Sutherland makes a very good point. He says, despite enlightened attempts to rebrand her as Elizabeth Gaskell, she remains obdurately Mrs. To call her anything else jars as painfully on the ear as attuned to the Victorian world, as with the eminent author of Jane Eyre, Mrs. Arthur Bell Nichols, to call her Mrs. Arthur Bell Nichols. There is a good reason for the title, Mrs. Gaskell. Wifeliness burns at the heart of Gaskell's creativity. To console herself in the mourning period when her only son, Willie, died of scarlet fever in 1845, she wrote a story of industrial life, strife, suffering, and death. And John um, Sutherland has an aside here. No Victorian novelist, incidentally, introduces more deathbeds into her fiction. <laughs> you may want to bear that in mind for summer reading. <laughs> um, but the book he's referring to is the one um, that, that I put on the, the list for today, Mary Barton, A Tale of Manchester Life, which was published in 1848. And Sutherland concludes that her art was forged in the furnace of maternal grief. Uh, and that is very true. Uh, a little bit more about um, Elizabeth Gaskell. Uh, she was, um, as I say, born in 1810. Her mother died when she was about one. And although she retained close contact with her father, she was ex effectively brought up. Her father was in London and that's where Elizabeth Gaskell was born. She was sent to live with her aunt, Hannah Lum, and uh, Hannah Lum lived in Nutsford in Cheshire, and that's the basis for Gaskell's uh, Cranford. She based on Nutford. Nutford's about 50 miles outside of Manchester. And so she had this, uh, this sort of dual uh, comparison growing up of this big city, Manchester at the time, the center of the textile industry and the mills and, um, you know, the, the cotton industry and Nutsford, which was Cranford and this little village life that was 15 miles from Manchester and also a million miles. Um, she, uh, uh, as I say, her mother had died. Her father remarried in uh, 1928 and Elizabeth Gaskell did not much like her stepmother. Um, and we find that, you know, a lot of Elizabeth Gaskell's life comes out in the plots of her books. Um, Wives and Daughters, which was a book that she was writing as she was that as she as she died, basically, um, is a lot to do with her relationship with her stepmother. Uh, one of her most famous books, North and South, is uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's take on the cultural differences she perceived between seeing you know the north of England, where her aunt lived in Nutsford, and the the south of England, focused on London, and the massive discrepancies between the two, both in uh, not just in wealth, but in attitude and um, culture. So uh, her life really informed her books to a, a tremendous amount. Um, her, she had a brother, uh, James, who uh, joined the Merchant Marines, the, um, the merchant version of the Navy. And he disappeared in uh, 1827 at sea. And so this is something else that comes up in quite a lot of her books, this motif of a beloved character seeming to be dead and then coming back to life. And sadly for Elizabeth Gaskell, her brother did not come back, but um, it is important to see just how much of her life um, is reflected in her books that way. Uh, and as I say, Mary Barton, the one um, that I put on the list for today is, is um, really as James, uh, John Sutherland said, uh, you know, forged in her own maternal grief over the death of her son. She did have daughters uh, who outlived her. She was not uh, childless after Willie died, but um, it obviously, uh, it, it, you know, is, is beyond devastating to think of um, losing any child. And, and she turned her grief into, um, in, into a sort of her art. Uh, she says, there's a little quotation from her at the top of the John Sutherland piece where she says, Says, no, I lost my page um, My heart burnt within me with indignation and grief. Um, so I think we can, you know, understand that. She had been married, by the way, I should have backed up to this. In 1832, she married the Reverend William Gaskell, and he was a Unitarian minister. 
And uh, this comes through in her works too. In one of her books, she talks about people of different branches of the Protestant, pray th uh, Protestant faith praying together and, and says, well, you know, they knelt down together and it did them no harm. So part of the attraction of her books now is to see she had some very forward thinking um, ideas for her time. She was kind of proto-feminist in a way. Um, Mary Barton, her first book, which is this one, uh, has a female protagonist and uh, she is like Dickens, a chronicler of um, the, the, the social um, times. And she does not shy away from giving you the, the sort of gritty details, how hard the lives were for these people who worked in these factories and mills. And uh, she demonstrates the abuses. So in, in a way she was as much of, uh, ahead of her time as Dickens was. Um, the book Mary Barton actually um, was published in, as I say, in 1848. She had originally titled it John Barton. And um, the miseries of the textile workers were so heavily depicted that, that her publisher said, I don't think anybody can stomach this. Can you uh, lighten it up a little bit? So uh, she did and she changed the protagonist from John to Mary and gave it a slightly more feminine, lighter feel to it. Uh, it was published in 1848 by Dickens Publishers and the novel was hugely a hit immediately. It made her famous. She became sort of, you know, the, the Kim Kardashian of her day, I suppose. She was a very beautiful woman as well, by the way. Um, Dickens invited her to write for his one of his magazines, for the magazine Household Words. And uh, she submitted uh, Cranford, which is one of her best known works and I, I, that has been serialized for the BBC. Uh, it's interesting to know that um, uh, Dickens paid her far less than he paid his uh, male contributors. So not surprising, but uh, a little sad. Anyway, Mary Barton, as I say, is um, Terrific first novel to pick up. It's not quite as big as some of the other ones if you want to dip your toe into the water. Um, her other books are equally rewarding and what she does have a genius for, I think is, is characterization as well as realism. And she gives us another take on the, the sort of Victorian era. She doesn't have Charles Dickens co uh, comedy uh, but her work is, is very rewarding. She's also very well known um, as being Charlotte Bronte's biographer. Uh, when Charlotte Bronte died, uh, Charlotte Bronte's father asked uh, Elizabeth Gaskell if she would write a, a biography of um, his daughter, and she did. Um, and then Elizabeth Gaskell herself died in 1865, um, sudden heart attack. So, um, I can talk a little bit more about the novel if you need, but I'd like to pause there. I see we've got quite a lot of questions coming in on the Q&A and I'd like to uh, see if anybody has got a hand raised or... Okay. Um, so a uh, couple of shout outs to Cameron. Not to me, of course, but uh, from Elizabeth, from Nancy, from Nikki. Um, so yes, he, he deserves the shout outs. He's a good boy. Susan Van Hemmel, could Kay spell author's names, please? Yes, um, it is Gaskell, G-A-S-K-E-L-L. -L. First name Elizabeth, and this book is Mary Barton. Um, Jane Hassel asked if I will send us a list of authors and books, and I will, I think I did, but maybe if you registered uh, later, Jane, you will, um, have missed that. So uh, uh, Susan says she found a list of them in the summer catalog. So, but I will certainly email the list out again. And Marlene offers the comment, you can read Mary Barton through Project Gutenberg for free. Yes, and that's a very good resource. That's why when we started doing these online classes um, uh, and, and switching to Zoom, um, I've tried to find, in terms of the, the Dickens classes, the longer classes, I tried to find uh, resources that uh, were available online because I realized people may not be able to get out to the store or to the library or what have you. Um, this course was planned a long time before we went on uh, online. So uh, not all of them will be available, but uh, Mary Barton is, yes, thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Mitchell, uh, there's also a person with a hand raised. Uh, okay, go ahead, Marianne. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. I, I don't have a question. Thank you anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you. And you're seeing the Q&A? Yeah, I'm seeing the Q&A. Sherry points out that Fairfax County Public Library also has it for free on Libby eBooks. So thank you for that. I appreciate those uh, comments. Um, I'll just read you a little bit of the opening of the book so you can get a sense of, of her prose. Um, and this is directly uh, part of uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's life because she's talking about that green area outside of Manchester that she would have known well living in Nutsford and, and traveling between uh, Nutsford and Manchester. And, and the book begins this way. There are some fields near Manchester, well known to the inhabitants as Green Hayes Fields, through which runs a public footpath to a little village about two miles distant. In spite of these fields being flat and low, nay, in spite of the want of wood, the great and usual recommendation of level tracts of land, there is a charm about them which strikes even the inhabitant of a mountainous district who sees and feels the effect of contrast in these commonplace but thoroughly rural fields with the busy bustling manufacturing town he left but half an hour ago. Here and there an old black and white farmhouse with its rambling outbuildings speaks of other times and other occupations than those which now absorb the population of the neighborhood. Here in their seasons may be seen in the country business of haymaking, plowing, etc., which is such pleasant mysteries for townspeople to watch. And here the artisan, deafened with noise of tongues and engines, may come to listen a while to the delicious sounds of rural life, the lowing of cattle, the milkmaid's call, the clatter and cackle of poultry in the old farmyards. You cannot wonder then that these fields are popular places of resort at every holiday time. And you would not wonder if you could see, or I properly describe, properly describe the charm of one particular style, that it should be on such occasions a crowded halting place. Close by, it is a deep clear pond reflecting in its dark green depths, the shadowy trees that bend over it to exclude the sun. The only place where its banks are shelving is on the side next to a rambling farmyard belonging to one of those old world gabled black and white houses I named above, overlooking the field through which the public footpath leads. And she goes on, and, and this is the, the tension always between her books in a lot of ways. We have this um, bucolic idyll, and then we're going to switch uh, fairly soon into you know, the sort of horrors of um, uh, the, the, the factory life and you know, the, the children being made to work, the machines and all those sorts of things. Um, she talks about holiday time. This is a time Pre, not when people had vacations, but when they had a day from work, they would um, escape the countryside, uh, escape to the countryside uh, as much as they possibly could to, to breathe in some fresh air. Um, no clean air acts in force at the time. So the smoke and the soot and the, and the smells in town would have been pretty horrible. And um, yet, you know, to, to get a couple of miles outside Manchester, you were back in a, in a place that could look as if it was a hundred years previously. Um, so uh, MC says, is North and South a reflection on class and wealth division? Um, yes, MC, North and South would absolutely um, apply to current times. Um, in, in Britain, it's kind of reversed. In this country, you have, you know, the North was the more prosperous side particularly after the Civil War and the South was less prosperous. And in Britain, it's reversed. The North has always been the poorer um, part of the country and the South, because it has London, has always been very wealthy. But, um, you know, literature transcends uh, it, its own time so that uh, you can look at these class divisions and, and see how they apply today. And of course, we can't be literal about it, but that's very perceptive uh, uh, comment to say that, you know, we. We can apply all these things to our times today. And, and um, Elizabeth Gaskell's portrait of maternal grief and suffering is as resonant in here 
uh, as any um, writer writing today. So thank you, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Cameron unless there's any more questions and let him talk to you about Muriel Spark. Uh, I will switch seats. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for the virtual welcome. And uh, although I can't see you, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Muriel Spark in particular her very famous and rightly revered novel, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Uh, Muriel Spark was, was born in Edinburgh in Scotland in uh, 1918. Um, she's certainly one of the most influential writers of her generation. Uh, when they tend to make lists, when various publications tend to make lists of uh, the most important British post-war writers, say Spark is routinely given a place on the list the contributions that she made to 20th century literature are indelible, and I, I think she continues to be a favorite of many writers at work today. The contribution of her masterpiece, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, is essentially formal, it seems to me. Her use of prolepsis or flash forward is distinctive and revolutionary in its implications. And again, it's something that I think uh, quite a few writers have subsequently learned from. That's not to overlook the novel's other myriad stylist, uh, stylistic accomplishments, of course. Uh, Nicole Krauss, who we will talk a little bit about in the uh, second session, uh, described the novel's sharp sentences and portraits as still feeling fresh and vivid. So she does many things very well in the novel, but um, time being limited, I'll focus primarily on those stunning flash forwards. Uh, before I do that, though, I'll say a few words about her biography. She was born Muriel Spark Camberg in 1918, the child of a Jewish engineer and a Christian uh, mother, a mother who called herself Gentile Jewish. Um, her, her Jewish heritage is something that she would deal a little bit with in some of her literary work and, and would uh, become a part of the kind of public feud that she had with her son many years later. She matriculated in 1934, but uh, Muriel couldn't afford to enter university. And so she took a course in secretarial skills instead. And then in 1937, she wasn't even 20 years old, but she got married uh, to a guy named Sidney Spark, who accepted a three-year teaching post in Southern Rhodesia. Um, but Sidney Spark was, was very mentally ill and theirs was to say the least a disastrous marriage. Uh, Solly, as he was known, teetered constantly on the brink of a nervous breakdown. He was violent and uh, apparently in his mania prone to firing off his pistol around the house. They did have a child born Robin in uh, 1938. And after a difficult few years, Muriel was able to, to get away. She and Solly separated. She moved to England in 1944, close to the end of the Second World War and was recruited to work in wartime intelligence for a period. After the war, she served as the editor of the Poetry Society's Poetry Review from 1947 to 1949 and embarked on a number of uh, affairs. She, she had a kind of very full and uh, complicated you know, romantic life uh, with a number of figures in the literary establishment at that time. Her son, meanwhile, Robin, was, was raised by her parents back in Scotland. Um, and they, they always had a very distant relationship from that point on. In her mid-30s, she began writing uh, literary criticism. And it was, it was relatively late for a fiction writer um, that she became known. It was in 1951 that she won the Observer Christmas story competition. She beat out 7,000 other contestants in order to win this prize, uh, which was also a substantial cash prize. And it, it allowed her to move uh, to a slightly nicer uh, place in town in Camberwell. She converted to Catholicism in 1954. Uh, and this would have a huge influence on quite a bit of her work. 
She published her first novel, The Comforters, in 1957. It attracted positive notices from Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh, among others. Uh, two other, of course, very notable English Catholic writers. Um, I believe when she converted, actually, that Graham Greene sent her uh, red wine and, and some food on the condition that she never pray for him. That was Greene's uh, condition. Uh, Muriel Spark became very famous in 1961 when she published The Prime of, of Miss Jean Brody. It was, it was international celebrity. The novel was originally published in a 1961 issue of The New Yorker. Uh, the New Yorker doesn't really do this anymore, but there were, there were times many years ago when they would devote an entire issue uh, to something like John Hersey's Hiroshima, for instance, um, or occasionally to, to an entire novel. And um, that, that's what they did with The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Uh, and apparently the magazine went even further than that. They gave Muriel Spark an office uh, and there was an understanding that whatever she chose to write, uh, they would print. And she did spend some time in New York, uh, which, which she enjoyed very much. Generally from the 50s to the 70s, she was extremely prolific. When she started publishing, she, she wrote about a book a year. And particularly from the prime of Miss Jean Brody on, uh, she had tremendous success. In 1966, she moved to Rome and she resided in, a, she resided apparently in a series of grand residences. She lived very well. Uh, Jean Brody had made her quite wealthy. It was, it was made into a film in the late sixties with Maggie Smith in the lead role. Uh, and there was a Broadway play as well. And, and that gave her financial security. As I say, she was prolific and much of her work, uh, especially from Jean Brody on, was very preoccupied with questions of theology. Her final years were, as John Sutherland actually has noted, uh, poisoned by a feud with her son, Robin. Robin uh, had become an Orthodox Jew and essentially he questioned her, her Gentile Jewish hybridity. They, they had a number of uh, public spats about his heritage and her heritage. Uh, and in the end, she, she cut him out of her will, leaving everything that she had uh, to a personal assistant of hers. And, and she made a number of nasty remarks about his art. So this was, this was a, a source of uh, great controversy and uh, perhaps at, at times obscured her, her literary uh, accomplishments in her later years. Nevertheless, she became a dame in 1993, and she died in Florence in 2006 and is buried there. Okay, so that's a little bit, just a little bit about Muriel Sparks' uh, biography. Let's, let's turn now to her limpid and lacerating prose in The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. It's a novel which centers on the eponymous Edinburgh school teacher and a group of six students in whom she, see, she seeks to inculcate her idiosyncratic and at times uh, deeply troubling uh, views, alarming views about love and art and politics. It's a very funny and, and merciless novel. And I, I think one of the least sentimental novels ever written about uh, young people, uh, about education ever written. Um, each, of the, each of the girls, in the prime of Miss Jean Brody, each of the girls that Jean Brody instructs is uh, famous at the school for something. For instance, there's a character named Rose Stanley who, who eventually becomes famous for sex at the school. Um, and there's another girl, Eunice Gardner, who's famous, I think this is great, for her sprightly gymnastics and glamorous swimming. I really like glamorous swimming very much. Um, and that's important to note because of the excerpt that I'm, I'm going to read you. One of the book's most shocking flash forwards comes in the very first chapter of the novel. When Miss Brody is lecturing a class of 10 year old girls on the virtues of remaining silent in certain contexts. Uh, basically, I think the headmistress comes in and asks them what they're up to. Uh, and the girls aren't very forthcoming with answers. And, and Jean Brody's appreciative because she's giving them instruction that she probably shouldn't be. As I say, she's, she's talking about the virtues of silence and she says to the class, Miss Jean Brody says to the class, it is well, you have to imagine this in the voice of Maggie Smith, it is well 
when in difficulties. To say never a word, neither black nor white. Speech is silver, but silence is golden. Mary, are you listening? What was I saying? Mary McGregor, lumpy, with merely two eyes, a nose and a mouth like a snowman, who was later famous for being stupid and always to blame, and who, at the age of 23, lost her life in a hotel fire, ventured, golden? What did I say was golden? Mary cast her eyes around her and up above. Sandy whispered, the falling leaves. The falling leaves, said Mary. Plainly, said Miss Brody, you were not listening to me. If only you small girls would listen to me, I would make of you the creme de la creme. So this is the very first chapter of the novel and Spark pauses very, very briefly just to let us know that this young girl, this 10 year old girl, Mary McGregor, will become famous for being uh, stupid and then she'll die in a hotel fire when she's 23 years old. And then she goes, she goes right back to the scene. She doesn't linger long on this pretty devastating piece of information. Consider another moment in which the, the cruelty is even more pronounced. We get another kind of summary judgment, as James Wood would call it. Miss Brody says at, at one point to Mary, Mary, you may speak quietly to Sandy. And Mary says, Sandy won't talk to me. And we get this information, said Mary, who later in that hotel fire ran hither and thither till she died. Sandy cannot talk to you if you are so stupid and disagreeable. Try to wear an agreeable expression, at least, Mary, says Miss Spark. By zooming ahead to reveal Mary McGregor's tragic fate, Spark adds a devastating and particularly poignant dimension to the taunts and cruelty that come her way during what will nevertheless turn out to be the happiest time of her life. The sadness of this mistreatment, which might otherwise seem comparatively mild, is powerfully compounded. Sparks, release, uh, Sparks flash forwards might be thought of as release valves for dramatic irony. Dramatic irony, of course, being a situation in which the reader is made aware of a disparity between the facts of a situation and the character's understanding of it. We know the fate that awaits Mary and, and many other characters of course, long before they do. This moves us to pity and a unique level of emotional engagement with these fictional creations. It also ties in quite nicely with the novel's preoccupation with Calvinism. Although Muriel herself was born Jewish and then became Catholic, the characters she's writing about are in a number of cases, they belong to the Church of Scotland and are Protestant. And so the novel itself is uh, very deeply interested and the Calvinist idea of predestination and, and of the idea of the, the elect, uh, because you know, there are these six girls that, that Jean Brody uh, favors as being in the, in the Brody set. Um, and so one could think of them as the elect at, at the school. Um, I could say a few more things, but I'll, I'll pause now to see if there are any questions. Uh, yes, I see here in the Q and A, uh, from, from Mary, would you repeat the word that means flash forward? Prolepsis is, is the formal term for that. So that's P-R-O-L-E-P-S-I-S is the, the formal term for flash forward. My understanding is that the, uh, the film version, which came out in the late 60s, 1969 or so, does away with the flash forwards, that it doesn't include them. And it, it can be very difficult to, to handle a flash forward or prolepsis prolepsies in, uh, in film for some reason. We're conditioned to know what a, what a flashback is when we see it on a screen, but a flash forward can be very disorienting. Um, and Spark does it so quickly also in the novel, as, as you saw. Uh, she'll sometimes sort of do it mid-sentence that it's, it's very difficult to replicate. So I'll just pause again to see if there are any questions or comments. If not, I'll note that uh, this novel gets taught quite a bit um, in, in my program at, at Columbia, the MFA program. And I think part of the reason that it does get taught so much um, is because it breaks a number of, of the rules. Um, partly with the flash forwards like I talked about, but I'll give you one more uh, example as well. At the beginning of uh, chapter three, 
in the novel, we get this information about Miss Brody. It is not to be supposed that Miss Brody was unique at this point of her prime, or that since, since such things are relative, she was in any way off her head. She was alone merely in that she taught in a school like Marsha Blaine's, that's the name of the school. There were legions of her kind, I'll repeat that. There were legions of her kind during the 1930s, women from the age of 30 and upward who crowded their war bereaved spinsterhood with voyages of discovery into new ideas and energetic practices in art or social welfare, education or religion. The progressive spinsters of Edinburgh did not teach in schools, especially in schools of traditional character like Marsha Blaine's School for Girls. It was in this that Miss Brody was, as the rest of the staff spinster had put it, a trifle out of place. But she was not out of place amongst her own kind, the vigorous daughters of dead or enfeebled merchants of ministers of religion. University professors, doctors, big warehouse owners of the past, or the owners of fisheries who had endowed these daughters with shrewd wits, high colored cheeks, constitutions like horses, logical educations, party spirits, and private means. They could be seen leaning over the democratic counters of Edinburgh grocer shops, arguing with the manager at three in the afternoon on every subject from the authenticity of the scriptures to the question of what the word guaranteed on a jam jar really meant. They went to lectures, lectures, tried living on honey and nuts, took lessons in German, and then went walking in Germany. They bought caravans and went off with them into the hills among the locks. They played the guitar. They supported all the new little theater companies. They took lodgings in the slums and dis distributing pots of paint, taught their neighbors the arts of simple interior decoration. They preached the inventions of Mary Stopes. They attended the meetings of the Oxford group and put spiritualism to their hawk eyed test. Some assisted in the Scottish nationalist movement, others like Miss Brody, called themselves Europeans in Edinburgh, a European capital, the city of Hume and Boswell. What's so striking about including this, this passage early in the novel is um, it's very unusual for a novelist to spend a lot of time telling you about how utterly ununique her main character is. That's just something that you don't see writers doing a lot. In fact, um, I think writers tend to feel a sense of pressure to do quite the opposite, to suggest that the character they're introducing you to is exemplary in, in some way and therefore worth uh, spending quite a bit of uh, time on. But Muriel Spark is much more unconventional and um, she's willing at times to suggest that her certain of her characters might be classified as, as types. Um, and again, this is something that Many novelists then and now would would resist, but it's it's uh, it doesn't diminish their vividness in any way. And, and of course, I think it's one of the, the primary appeals of this uh, very fine novel. So I'll pause one more time just to see if there are any questions before I turn it back over. Uh, sir, there is a uh, hand raised. Uh... Yes. Hi, Ellen. Hi. I wanted to ask. Um... Is the kind of cruelty that these girls practice among one another typical of her novels? And two, what kind of attitude towards this cruelty among women does the narrator project? Does the narrator project an attitude? Does she take an attitude towards this kind of cruelty? And is this cruelty typical among women? Thanks, Ellen. That's a great question. I can't, I can't speak to Sparks' other novels. This is the only novel I'm familiar with. Oh. But what I can what I can say is that the the narrator generally doesn't um, doesn't comment on this cruelty, but but um, simply observes it. Um, this this kind of omniscient third person narrator that we get, and not only does this omniscient narrator not comment on the cruelty between the girls, but indulges, as I suggested, um, in a kind of cruelty herself, which is the cruelty of revealing these girls. Uh, uh, fates, um, and I think that's part of the success of the of the novel. There, there's a great quote from Anton Chekhov. He was writing a letter to a contemporary of his, uh, and he said to this contemporary, "When you want to when you want to move the reader, uh, that is, move the reader emotionally, be colder." <laughs> and I think that's I think that instinct is is one that Muriel Spark has certainly in the prime of Miss Jean Brody. 
uh, as well. I, I think that sometimes when we see real cruelty or coldness on the part of certain characters or on the part of a narrator, uh, whatever native compassion we might have as readers rushes in to fill that gap. Uh, and then we're evolved emotionally in the book in a way that we might otherwise uh, have been. <clears throat> Very interesting because the passage that you read showed real compassion for spinsters. Yeah, well, there's a kind of, you know, that, that writing, there's a real sort of fondness of, of um, that this is a type of person. And on the one hand, it, it is, as you say, um, I think there's a note of compassion there. On the other hand, um, the, that, that passage also is saying that Jean Brody, who, who has a certain view of herself, um, is really not that unique. She uses the phrase legions of women. There were legions of women like her. She's not really that special a person. So there's, there's always that little, uh, in this book certainly, there's always that kind of little note of cruelty creeping in as well. Thank you. Uh, does uh, Sally Burdick also raised her hand? Uh... Sure. Okay. Uh, my last few years of teaching were first and third grade and I really don't like admitting this, but girls, would be cruel to other girls. They actually would have their own clique. And then mm. someone would come up to me and complain. Now, I never saw this with boys. And I'm thinking, is this innate? I mean, these are little kids, little girls that would, you know, have their little cliques. Uh, so I, I don't know. I hate to admit it, being a woman myself, that perhaps this doesn't happen with guys. The boys would play, they may have a fight, but they're friends again. But the girls would really probably pick on someone. And this was little girls, I just want to say. Well, yeah, maybe at some point we'll, <laughs> we'll have to- Sorry, I had to admit it. We'll have to do a class on um, stories of, of male cruelty or something to, to, to balance it out. But I, I will say that is one of the, that, that is one reason to read the novel is, is um, of course, that Spark is taking on these these larger questions about um, about girlhood and about, uh, of course, the role that nature and nurture both play. I know we have other questions, but I, I don't want to shortchange. Um, I believe uh, Edith Wharton is next, and um, I'm very much afraid her ghost will haunt me or something if I if I take. I can take one more question. Is uh, Joan Telemi has her hand raised? Yes. Hi, Joan. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Uh, believe it or not, I, I reared two sons, and, and I did notice, uh, and, and I taught grade school for a short time. Mm. Little girls have a pension. Oh, let me back up very briefly. Little boys, or boys generally, when they get annoyed at each other, they'll, pu they'll punch each other in the nose and it's over. Perhaps the little girls who are trained to be, uh, to be refined or whatever, they, they take more devious. But I found them to be a lot nastier than the boys. So that, that's a whole other class. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. And uh, now if I do take any more time, uh, my mother is going to punch me in the nose. So <laughs> I'm get out of the way here. No, I promise not to be like uh, Muriel Spark. When my son gets his uh, novel published, his art published, I will not be mean about it. Um, but yes, we should all worry a little bit about Edith Wharton's ghost haunting us, I think. Um, Edith Wharton is one of my favorite American writers. She was born in 1862 and she lived until 1937. Um, she was born Edith Jones into a, a very um, moneyed family, not quite one of the 400 moneyed families um, in New York society at the time, but very close. Um, as I say, her, her maiden name was Jones, and, and some people believe that, um, that the phrase keeping up with the Joneses came from that family. Um, she had a bequest uh, from a distant relative when she was a very young girl that enabled her to, to be wealthy for her, independently wealthy her whole life. Um, and she, you know, became known really as this chronicler of uh, the upper crust New York society. Um, she was a sickly child. She was educated at home. Uh, her mother um, was, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Wharton's work features on the fact that she had 
all this money and luxury, but it was uh, a very emotionally frigid atmosphere for growing up. Um, so she, uh, she had all this, you know, sort of wealth and, and uh, uh, you know, all the, all the advantages of her time, but um, nobody seemed to be very interested in her as a child. And, and um, she was, you know, sort of, uh, uh, she started writing stories when she was nine, but her mother discouraged her and said, you know, this is not something that ladies do. Her mother also promised her never to write a novel, uh, never to read a novel until after she got married. And Edith Wharton said, well, you know, okay. And, and she held fast to that, which is uh, astonishing really. Um, she had a brief um, engagement to a, a, a chap called Harry Layden Stevens. Um, she was uh, fond of this, this young man, but her parents hugely disapproved of him. And only the engagement only came about after Edith's father died in 1882. Uh, so she was engaged to him for a while, but uh, the month that the marriage was supposed to have taken place, the relationship abruptly ended and uh, Henry disappeared out of the picture. Um, she married Edward Robbins Wharton, known as Teddy in, um, uh, shortly after that, and very much mirrored you know, what Cameron said about uh, Muriel Spark. Her husband had acute depression, sliding towards insanity, and made it a very difficult marriage. Um, they, they were to, they, she eventually was able to divorce him in 1913, but uh, things have been very difficult. Most people, uh, uh, biographers, say that the marriage was completely sexless, and... Um, Although Edith Wharton had tried to, uh, to, to, to be the embodiment of a good wife, um, that, that she was desperately, desperately unhappy. Um, they did have all this money and she, they had places in New York and they lived in Newport, Rhode Island and they had a couple of different places. Um, these places that they call cottages, you know, in a vast hundred room mansions. Um, up there in that little bit of Newport, Rhode Island where all the big houses are. Uh, her first love was really um, uh, sort of interior design and garden design. And her first book was about interior design and design of houses. So it's interesting because she brings a lot of that into her work too. Her, her, her houses in her work seem to be almost um, bigger than just houses. They're metaphors for a lot of the, uh, um, the life experiences that people have in them and they become characters almost in there in there that way too um she was always compared to henry james in her lifetime and she she really hated that she said um the continued cry that i am an echo of mr james makes me feel rather hopeless um as well it might because she is certainly a phenomenal author in her own right her most famous novel uh, age of innocence propelled her to uh, some sort of literary stardom, but, but it was muted because maybe because of the time or because she was always considered, you know, the lesser Henry James. Her novels have become much more popular in um, current times because of uh, Hollywood movie adaptations of The Age of Innocence uh, and um, uh, other adaptations. So she's now much more popular than actually she was in her lifetime. So uh, I hope that if her ghost is up there, she is at least uh, appreciative of that. Um, her novels, again, as I say, focus very much on the kind of world she grew up in. As a social chronicler, she is unparalleled. She talks about, um, you know, these, these fabulously wealthy people in society, and she does so with a satirist eye. She's, she's very sharp about it, and that's really what makes it uh, her work so worthwhile, I think. She, she doesn't just accept this um, for what it is. She, she um, holds it up to the light and asks us whether we approve of it. Um, she managed to get her literary revenge on a lot of people in her novels that had you know, been part of her world, particularly her mother, who uh, she depicts in one book as indolent, spendthrift, censorious, disapproving, superficial, icy, dry, and ironic. Well, 
So we have gone from, uh, you know, Elizabeth Gaskell's maternal warmth and uh, love to, um, you know, Edith Wharton, who felt herself very much dissed by her mother uh, as a child, but was able to, to uh, portray her thus in her novels. So I think that's fascinating. Um, like Henry James, she destroyed most of her papers before her death, um, but she wrote a, a, a snippet of something that never got published that was practically pornographic um, about a, a rape of a woman by her, um, by a, a, a half brother, I, I think. Um, and uh, critics have noted she, she would, it, it was published um, years after her death and critics said she would have been horrified to know, I think that it had seen the light. Um, but her other work is, uh, is remarkable in its, its tone for balancing that sort of, she does balance a nice dry irony about this, um, social world that she finds herself in. Um, the one I picked, although The Age of Innocence is wonderful, the one I picked is The Reef. Um, she wrote this uh, just before the First World War. It was published in 1912, just after Ethan Frome. Uh, at the time, this was when her marriage was really uh, just unraveling completely, uh, just before the divorce. She had um, she had a couple of affairs. She'd fallen in love with uh, um, some, uh, other members of her society and I, I had a long affair with a chap called Morton Fulton who's a, a journalist and I think perhaps that propelled her to realize that um, she needed to escape this vastly unhappy uh, unhappy marriage. Um, either, uh, this book The Reef is, is a, a story about uh, George Darrow who journeys from um, London to, to France Intending to propose to Anna Leith, who is a widow, and uh, it it, inc it includes a lot of the sort of the morals at the time. The, the introduction to my version is by Louis Ochenslos, and he points out that um, at the time, um, extramarital physical love is considered damning to a woman and only mildly reprehensible to a man. Um, and of course, you know that that's true. It's it's actually in a lot of ways still true today. So um, Edith Wharton was not um, saying anything remarkable in that, but it's the way she talks about this and describes this and the way she uh, asks us to say, how fair is this? That makes her um, and actually quite a modern writer for her time. Um, her book uh, opens uh, with uh, the words on a telegram, unexpected obstacle, please don't come till 30th, Anna. All the way from Charing Cross to Dover, the train had hammered the words of the telegram into George Darrow's ears, ringing every change of irony on its commonplace syllables, rattling them out like a discharge of musketry, letting them one by one drip slowly and coldly into his brain, or shaking, tossing, transposing them like the dice in some game of the gods of malice. And now as he emerged from his compartment at the pier and stood facing the windswept platform and the angry sea beyond, they leapt out at him, as if from the crest of the waves, stung and blinded him with a fresh fury of derision. Unexpected obstacle. Please don't come till 30th, Anna. Of course, setting the beginning of the novel in the, in the beginning of a, uh, with the opening words of a telegram, make it a very modern novel. This is not something that uh, Elizabeth Gaskell would have done. As I read to you the beginning of Mary Barton, you could see that she wanted to set the scene in much the same way that, that Dickens at the beginning of David Copperfield would say, um, I was born as I've been told and so on and so forth. And, and there is a certain Victorian sensibility in a lead in to that, um, that kind of novel. Although Edith Wharton was born in the middle of the Victorian age, this is a post Victorian novel, a Georgian novel, and she is, uh, right bang up to date by letting us know that she's beginning this with a telegram and without any of that formal scene setting that we get. So um, I'm gonna pause there. Uh, Marlene says, the reef is also found in Project Gutenberg. Thank you. And I believe that Nancy Sheila and somebody else, I'm not sure, is doing a um, course on Edith Wharton very soon. So I was hoping that this would provide 
um, a little uh, insight to, to um, Edith Wharton and, and get you to, to go to that class because that will be fabulous. So uh, unless we have any hands raised, I'm gonna switch it right back over to Cameron to talk about uh, Penelope Fitzgerald. Okay, we are good. Okay, we'll jump forward a bit here to talk about Penelope Fitzgerald. Um, Penelope Fitzgerald was, was uh, another hugely influential uh, British writer, in this case, an English uh, writer. And again, another person who is uh, routinely found on lists mentioning the, the most uh, influential post-war writers. She was born in uh, Lincoln, England in 1916 um, and has been lauded for many of her books, uh, but in particular for her innovative works of historical fiction, which are strikingly lapidary and successful, as Jonathan Franzen has noted, in illustrating the radical otherness of other times. Uh, before we discuss the authority and fluency of her style and its inimitable success in conjuring a different era, I'll say a little bit about Fitzgerald's biography. I'll also uh, mentioned that I'll be um, reading a little bit from her, her final book, The, the Blue Flower, uh, as well. But first, the biography. Uh, she was born Penelope Knox in Lincoln, as I said, in 1916. That's a cathedral city in the, the county town of Lincolnshire in the East Midlands. Her father, Edmund Knox, was the editor of Punch, which was an influential uh, weekly humor magazine. Um, actually, I believe the modern a use of the word cartoon to mean this kind of funny illustration or drawing comes from uh, Punch in the 19th century. Um, he, of course, was the editor long after that. Um, and her mother, Christine, Penelope's mother, Christine, had been one of the first female students at Oxford. So it was uh, a family full of very accomplished people. Uh, a biography came out just a couple of years ago of Penelope Fitzgerald, written by Hermione Lee. And in it, uh, Lee characterizes Fitzgerald's family as a brilliantly clever English family, distinguished by alarming honesty, caustic wit, shyness, moral rigor, willpower, oddness, and powerful banked down feelings erupting in moments of sentiment or in violent bursts of temper and gloom, uh, which sounds to me like a recipe for creating a novelist. Penelope attended uh, Wickham Abbey, a girl's boarding school, which apparently she hated. Uh, and then finally Somerville College at Oxford University, where she won a scholarship for the best candidate in her year. Uh, again, I'm not so sure that she enjoyed her, her time there in, in part because uh, the, the Knox name, she was born Penelope Knox, uh, was, was well known there and she felt a lot of pressure to live up to her parents and to other members of her family. Four years after graduating in 1942, she married uh, Desmond Fitzgerald. Uh, during the war, Penelope wrote for Punch, uh, although not fiction, always nonfiction, and she worked for the BBC. And in the early 50s, she and her husband Desmond co-edited a cultural journal called World Review, uh, which, which published a number of people. I think it was the, the first uh, place that in, in the UK, the J.D. Salinger's story for Esme with Love uh, and Squalor was, uh, was published. Um, Fitzgerald's writing at this time in, in World Review was, was critical uh, writing. It was, it was nonfiction, it wasn't fiction, um, and, and quite wide ranging. She wrote about subjects as disparate as uh, Alberto Moravia and, and Spanish painting and a number of, of other things. Um, Life grew very difficult for the Fitzgeralds as the 50s uh, progressed. It was another difficult uh, marriage. Desmond, who had studied law, slid into alcoholism, and Penelope struggled to look after their three children. Uh, the family moved several times to kind of kind of worse and worse uh, housing each time. And they even lived in the early 60s, from 1960 to 1963, on a Thames houseboat in, in pretty grim conditions. Um, in the biography that was written of Fitzgerald, 
we learned that there were frequent power cuts, permanent damp, no oven, scant and basic food, um, and that uh, Penelope slept on a day bed in the room that also functioned, I think, as their living room. Uh, the houseboat actually began to sink in 1963 and had to be towed away. And on the day when that actually occurred, uh, Fitzgerald arrived at the school where she was teaching and said to her students, I'm sorry I'm late, but my house sank. Um, and one, one kind of encounters this unflappability uh, in her prose too. After the houseboat sank, the Fitzgerald spent four months in a homeless shelter in London, which sounds like it was very grim indeed, before receiving public housing, where they remained for 11 years until the children left to attend university. Uh, Fitzgerald started teaching in 1960. She would eventually teach at a, a school that was a, a, a crammer, a school that prepared um, certain English students for the university uh, entry exams uh, for uh, Oxbridge, uh, for instance. Uh, one of her students actually was Edward St. Aubin, you know, who would go on to find great fame as a novelist himself. One of the interesting things about Fitzgerald's biography is that for a fiction writer, she, she found success uh, relatively late because she began working relatively late. Um, she published her first novel, which is a, a murder mystery uh, entitled The Golden Child in 1977, by which time she was already in her late uh, 50s. Um, although her the first book I think of hers that seems to really be revered is The, the Bookshop, which came in 1978. She won the Booker Prize for Offshore in 1979, which I, I believe deals uh, with uh, a houseboat and is somewhat autobiographical. Um, and then in the 1980s and, and early 90s embarked on a series of uh, novels that were historical culminating in uh, The Blue Flower, which came out in 1995. Um, her final book, and it's often thought to be her uh, magnum, her magnum opus, uh, she, she received the National Book Critics Circle Award for it in 1997, which is, of course, one of the uh, three or four biggest uh, literary prizes here in the United States. So she was celebrated uh, not just in the UK, but here as well. The Blue Flower is about the 18th century German uh, poet uh, Friedrich von Hardenberg, who is better known by his pen name Novalis, specifically the book deals with his deeply enigmatic love for a pretty uh, banal 12 year old child named uh, Sophie von Kuhn and his eventual engagement to her. Um, the novel is also a strange and bewitching portrait of the romantic era in Germany. Uh, James Wood, the great uh, literary critic, uh, notes that the intelligent, high spirited Hardenberg family uh, very much resemble Penelope's own family, the, the Knoxes, this kind of um, very intelligent, high achieving family. Um, and as he writes, they are brought alive in astonishingly brief, elusive vignettes, fleeting chapters closer to the eloquent insufficiency of poems rather than to the reflexive garrulousness of fictional prose. Narrative threads seem to be snipped off at obscure junctions. Nothing is baldly stated. Yet the form contradictorily holds dreamy, precise, magical, but always very definite. Um, and and that's, that's of course totally apt. Uh, it's, it's a long-ish novel, The Blue Flower, but the chapters are very short. Sometimes as you can see, just a couple of pages uh, long. And it's, it is a very mysterious novel in a, a number of ways. To give you a, a sense of what James Wood is talking about, I'll read a little bit from the novel's uh, first few pages in which Jacob Dietzmaler, who's a medical student and a friend of Hardenberg's or a friend of Novalis's uh, from university accompanies him home. This is how the blue flower begins. Chapter one, wash day. Jacob Dietzmaler was not such a fool that he could not see that they had arrived at his friend's home on the wash day. They should not have arrived anywhere, certainly not at this great house, the largest but two in Wiesenfeld at such a time. Dietmaler's own mother supervised the washing three times a year. Therefore, the household had linen and white underwear for four months only. He himself possessed 89 shirts, no more. But here, at the Hardenberg house in Klostergasse, 
He could tell from the great dingy snowfalls of sheets, pillowcases, bolster cases, vests, bodices, drawers, from the upper windows into the courtyard where grave looking servants, both men and women, were receiving them into giant baskets that they washed only once a year. This might not mean wealth. In fact, he knew that in this case it didn't, but it was certainly an indication of long standing, a numerous family also. The underwear of children and young persons, as well as the larger sizes, fluttered through the blue air as though the children themselves had taken to flight. Fritz, I'm afraid you have brought me here at an inconvenient moment. You should have let me know, here I am, a stranger to your honored family, knee deep in your small clothes. That's Jacob speaking. How can I tell when they're going to wash, said Fritz. Anyway, you're a thousand times welcome at all times. The free her is trampling on the unsorted garments, said the housekeeper, leaning out of one of the first floor windows. Fritz, how many are there in your family, asked Diet Mahler. So many things. Then he shouted suddenly, there is no such concept as a thing in itself. Fritz, leading the way across the courtyard, stopped, looked around, and then in a voice of authority shouted back, gentlemen, look at the wash basket. Let your thought be the wash basket. Have you thought the wash basket? Now then, gentlemen, let your thought be on that that thought the wash basket. And it continues on uh, from here. What I would like to point out is the extraordinary control of Fitzgerald's prose and the almost somber lyricism at work here, just in these opening few passages. Um, note that for the very forbidding double negative in the opening line, Jacob Dietmaler was not such a fool that he could not see that they had arrived at his friend's home on the wash day. It's very bold to begin that way with a sentence uh, which certain readers might find uh, confusing or off-putting or might have to read uh, twice. Generally, the instinct is to kind of ease uh, readers into the story or to give them a hook of some kind which they might find irresistible. Um, but Fitzgerald puts, puts that sentence up front and it, 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 it instantly strikes that note of radical otherness to which you know, Jonathan Franzen, for instance, alludes in describing the book. And then it's striking to see how Fitzgerald moves with a swift economic elegance from an itemization of the laundry, the Hardenberg laundry to the poetry of the underwear fluttering through the blue air as though the children themselves had taken to flight, which is of course an image freighted with all kinds of mystical overtones. And then we get that very strange dialogue, which I read you just a little bit, uh, which is wonderfully eccentric and stilted. And of course, what it really sounds like is a translation of the era's German idiom. It sounds as though we're getting subtitles to the words, English subtitles, of course, to the words that these characters actually spoke. Uh, and as Wood uh, observes also, we, we can see Fitzgerald poking fun at Hardenberg early on in the narrative for his uh, enormous and sometimes misplaced exuberance. All this talk about there is no thing but a thing itself and let your mind be on the wash basket and then on the thing that thought about the wash basket. These are young men who have uh, studied philosophy, the philosophy of the day. This is the Romantic era, beginning of the Romantic era, um, are very enamored with it and um, like to go around talking about uh, philosophy and metaphysics uh, all the time, even when it, it may not be so uh, appropriate or welcomed by other characters. Um, I'll pause there to see if we have any questions. Uh, yes, what is lapidary referencing Fitzgerald? Uh, the, the word lapidary, it, I, I think the uh, original root of it is uh, connected to uh, writing on gravestones. It, it just means that her style is uh, economical and beautiful, and there's never a word a wasted. That's what I mean by lapidary. Um, yes, and Nikki writes, I'm surprised her family didn't help her financially. Was her relationship with parents not strong as she got older? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very surprising, but apparently she, uh, she refused to ask her family for help. So I'm not so sure that they turned her down. Um, my understanding from reading about the Hermione Lee biography is that uh, she, she didn't want to ask them for uh, assistance while she was struggling. Those are both great questions. Um, I think we have one more here. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just say that I, I marvel at the blue flower, particularly for how it manages to avoid virtually every pitfall of historical fiction. And it is the kind of novel that people who don't normally like historical fiction 
tend uh, to like. It avoids wooden prose, of course. Fitzgerald is a beautiful writer. Avalanche is a boring period detail. It's very well researched, but um, she gives us manageable doses. She also avoids ham-handed ventriloquisms of past figures. Um, and she, she manages not to um, let her research stick out like a sore thumb, which I think is often something that happens in uh, certain works of historical fiction. Uh, the Romantic area, this, this question from Donna, the Romantic area dates back to Poe. Was Fitzgerald influenced at all in her writing by the American Romantic era? Not to my knowledge. Um, I think she, she was really influenced by German romanticism, Novalis himself. The, the book is really about Novalis before he becomes Novalis, when he's just Fritz Hardenberg in love with this 12 year old girl and no one can figure out why, because she's, she's dull and she's not even particularly um, beautiful. Um, sh you know, Fitzgerald is thinking of the era, of, the era of, of Goethe, of, of late 18th century uh, Germany. And that's, that's really what's on her mind. And she, she obviously had read quite a bit, not only of Goethe and Novalis, but also of, of non-fictional works about that period. But it's a great question. Thank you. So I'll just pause to see if there are any others. There are no hands raised. So. Okay. In that case, I will thank you and uh, turn it back over. Um, I'm loving the idea of doing laundry only four times a year. Can we do that here? Um, the book I picked originally is this one, Gate of Angels. This is my favorite Fitzgerald book. And, and as I said, I planned this course not knowing whether Cameron would be able to join me. And that's the book I put on the list. Um, it is, uh, when Cameron was able to join me, he argued for the blue flower because that's his favorite and, and, and that's fine. This book is set in 1912, which is when um, Edith Wharton wrote The, the Reef uh, and at um, Cambridge University. And it's just, um, an, an absolute joy of a book and a little book. And I strongly, if you want to um, find another Penelope Fitzgerald, The Gate of Angels is, uh, is just beautiful. So um, that's why there's a discrepancy. I will send out another list uh, with both books on. So you have both references. Um, she is a tremendous writer. I, I, I read The Gate of Angels when I was at university, I think, and I, I, I was just stunned that somebody could write that well. Um, okay, so the final one on our list for today is um, Edwidge Danticat. I realized, by the way, I chose three women, all whose names begin with E, Elizabeth, Edith, and Edwidge. So today is brought to you by the letter E, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I found a quotation the other day I came across from the dancer Twyla Tharp. And uh, she said that art is the only way to run away without leaving home, which is, uh, of course, absolutely true and beautifully said. And um, through Edwidge Danticat's stories and, and novels, we can run away to, to Haiti uh, or to New York as well without leaving home. Very, very different author from uh, the others we've mentioned. Um, she's still alive and working, a youngster, born in 1969. And she was born in uh, Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Um, when she was two years old, her father left to come to New York. Her mother joined him when uh, Edward was four years old and she was left behind um, with an aunt and uncle. So, uh, you know, like, um, uh, Elizabeth Gaskell brought up by uh, an aunt and uncle, but she was able to join her parents at the age of 12 in New York. And, and she's really pretty much lived in New York since then. She goes back to Haiti a lot. Um, she has um, uh, been teaching there for a while. She graduated from Barnard College in 1990 and she got her MFA from Brown in 1993. So, no, Columbia, obviously, right, Cam. Um, but uh, she's been teaching at um, uh, uh, both New York University in their language program and the University of Miami um, on and off ever since. Her first novel uh, was Breath, Eyes, Memory, and uh, it really uh, brought her a lot of attention. Uh, and she has such a different voice. 
Um, she was named by Granta Magazine, one of the 40 best young novelists in the country after that. And the New York Times is one of 30, um, under 30 to watch. Uh, she's married, she has a couple of daughters now, but she's still lecturing and teaching from time to time. Um, I, I chose this because it's a collection of short stories and it's, it's an easy way into Edward Danticat. Um, the title Crick Crack is explained on the back of this book. Um, before some Haitians tell a story, they ask Crick and their eager listeners respond crack. Um, and Edward Danticat talks a lot about the storytelling culture of Haiti that um, when she was a young girl living in Haiti, that, that was their um, enjoyment at the end of the, the, the day to sit down and tell stories and, and obviously got a very rich heritage from that. Um, the stories in Crick Crack are all about women, about women trying to make sense of their families and uh, about their lives in Haiti and their lives in New York. And, and um, somehow they all end up being intertwined. Um, when I said, you know, art is a, is a way of um, running away without leaving home, we, we can go to a different world in these stories, but the themes are universally about womanhood and motherhood and um, a woman's place in the world and whether that is in Haiti or whether in New York and how we find ourselves um, struggling with these questions that, that bedevil all of us, no matter where we are. Um, she also notes in this book, particularly in the Haiti uh, stories that whenever women have difficult times, they, they take to the stoves and start cooking food. And that's something that I think, you know, every Jewish family, every Italian family, every Chinese family, every American family will understand is, you know, this need of, well, you know, people are struggling and, and life is difficult. So I'm going to feed you because that makes me feel better. I can nurture you and I can make people feel um, better by, by cooking. So there, there is this kind of universality and, and you see, you know, whenever there's a difficult moment in some of these stories, somebody goes and cooks something which is great, and it makes you hungry. But um, I just want to read you just a little bit that shows you um, uh, Danticat's uh, heritage. This is from a story, uh, A Wall of Fire Rising, and this one is set in, in Haiti. And um, the story begins with um, Guy and Lily and their, their little boy, they're in a shack. Guy comes home from work. And the little boy comes in and says, you know, he got a part in a play and um, he has to, to learn his lines. Um, and they have their supper. And then uh, a guy, the father says, let's go to the sugar mill. Uh, and then there's a little division and the next major paragraph starts this way. Their feet sounded as though they were playing a wet wind instrument as they slipped in and out of the puddles between the shacks in the shanty town. Near the sugar mill was a large television screen in an iron grill cage that the government had installed so that the shanty town dwellers could watch the state sponsored news at eight o'clock every night. After the news, a gendarme would come and turn off the television set, taking home the key. On most nights, the people stayed at the site long after the gendarme had gone and told stories to one another beneath the big blank screen. They made bonfires with dried sticks, corn husks and paper, cursing the authorities under their breath. So obviously she's referring to the, you know, very repressive times in Haiti. Um, this book here that I have is the 20th anniversary edition. It was actually published originally in, um, uh, 1991, I believe, or various dates because some of the stories were published in magazines first. Uh, her first novel, full length novel, Eyes, Breath, Memory, uh, Breath, Eyes, Memory, I'm sorry, was um, 1995, which is um, the year Cameron was born. Um, but you can see from that little passage that she, she takes us right to Haiti. She puts us right there. We can hear those footsteps, the, the woodwind instrument. It's just a beautiful image. And then we have this cultural discrepancy between our lives in the, in the West, you know, glued to the television and binge watching, um, in my case, Great British Bake Off on 
PBS or what have you, but the, the Haitian culture, this telling stories, this richness when they have so little of their lives and, and Dandy Cat manages to weave that in with her tales also of, um, you know, the, the Haitians displaced in New York, like her parents and herself eventually. Um, and she is just a, a beautifully lyrical writer uh, whose imagery it just transports you. So I have uh, one question here. Uh, this is a book list for today's talk. I sent it out quite a long time ago, but I am gonna send it out uh, again this afternoon and update it with Cameron's choice of book. So you will get it, if you signed up for this course, you will get it in the email from uh, Ollie. So I'm gonna pause there. We have about five minutes left. You can ask me about Dante Cat or anybody else, or you can ask Cameron, he can come and stand here and see if you have any questions or comments about um, anything that we've read. Uh, just to let you know, next week we are going to be looking at um, the only non-fiction writer I've included, who is Mary Carr. Um, Lydia Davis, who is a Canadian writer most known for her short stories, but also a fabulous translationalist. Um, her translation of Madame Bovary is, is my go-to. Uh, Nadim Gordema from South Africa, who is a Nobelist and um, very little known, it seems, I think, in this country. Uh, Nicole Krauss, who is uh, currently writing in um, New York, and Louise Erdrich, who is a hugely successful uh, and popular novelist, again, young and still working. So I now can see we have a few questions. Um, uh, MC says, with the lyrical nature of the passages, have any of these women written poetry? I believe Danticat has written poetry. Um, I think also that um, uh, Edith Wharton wrote poetry, but I'd have to check that. Um, Dante Cat does not write in a lot of dialect. You will not struggle with any of her prose, Belinda. She, um, she writes in, uh, in very, very clear English. Occasionally there's a phrase. Um, uh, Dante Cat grew up speaking both English and um, French. But she said at uh, her language at home in um, Haiti when she was with her aunt and uncle was Haitian Creole, but that doesn't really appear in her book. So you will not um, you will not have any problem reading reading these. Uh, they are beautifully clear. I have a question. Yes. Uh, was Dante Cart born middle class or was she a wealthier Haitian? How did her, how did her family managed to escape from Haiti? Were they part of the abysmal? They, they were not the poorest of poor, but she was certainly not wealthy. And, her, and that's, you can, I think you can see that in the discrepancy of time in the leaving because her father left two years before her mother was able to scrape up enough money to go. And it took him another uh, then eight years before they could afford to send for Edwidge. So they were not the, the very bottom. They were, I think we, if you read the story, Wall of Fire Rising about Gar Guy and Lily, um, Guy has a good job, although they live in a shack. And I, I think that one is perhaps quite autobiographical about the nature of her family circumstances. They had enough money to eat well and put a tiny little bit of by. And in this uh, story in the wa Wall of Fire Rising, the little boy comes home from school and the father is worried that they're gonna have to buy him new clothes to take part in the play. But the inference is if they have to buy him new clothes, they will. So there's just a little bit left over each month. So not quite at the bottom of the heap, but certainly not um, wealthy either. 